<laughs> Special interest egg! Yay! Hello my dears! Did you know that some of the most famous and widely used literature tropes and writing styles were created by neurodiversity? Well, have I got news for you. But before we get into that, I have two things going on in my life. So, first of all, I am in a play, and it's called Mackinal, and it's described by the college as a play that offers the tale of a very ordinary young woman whose very ordinary life, which we follow through nine scenes, puts her on a factory-like conveyor belt to murder and execution. I am one of three lovely people to play the young woman in this production, and I had so much fun in this role. She's super oddy and queer-coded, and I absolutely adored it. So if you're interested in seeing it, I, it will... <laughs> It will be available to stream from April 28th to May 2nd at the link that I will put into the description once I have it. I also want to mention that it's a very intense, no, not intense, I mean intense, intense. The show's emotionally a lot, so just be aware of that if you plan to watch it. Secondly, I have another music video premiere coming up. So one week from today, on Saturday, May 1st at 2 p.m., I'm releasing the official music video for my new-ish single, Alive, which is going to be really pretty and naturey and springy and princessy. It includes my favorite dress, which is this one because we filmed it today. Um, the premiere link may not be up by the time this video is published, but I'll include it in the description once I have it. Also, if you're new here and incredibly confused, hi, my name is Sydney, I'm autistic, disabled, and gay, and I do theater things, and I'm also a musician, and I'm in college. Yep. Before we begin talking about neurodiversity and how it's created some of the most famous literature tropes and writing styles, and yes, I do have academic sources and articles to prove this, I want to acknowledge that a lot of this is theorized. Much like we theorize that certain famous people from the past were gay based on what we know of their lives, but we cannot, of course, just go and ask them. So we do our best. What we do know is that neurodiversity has always existed, even though we didn't specifically label it as such. Just like queerness, just like transness. So keep that in mind as we go along. Today we are going to talk about two sides of literature. First is going to be character tropes, and then the second is going to be the actual structure of the written work. Now with character tropes, I've been able to identify five major character tropes that encompass the majority of the characters that read as autistic. And you will notice some serious gender roles within my examples here, so just that's important to acknowledge. Some of my examples are characters such as Sherlock Holmes, which are based off of real life people who we now presume to be autistic. Others are written by presumed neurodivergent people. For example, you will notice a lot of Jane Austen and Louisa May Alcott here in my examples. And some are just picture perfect examples of a trope, so I had to include them. So the first one is the absent-minded professor. This is the character that is a genius, but he's also a little quirky, and everybody's okay with the fact that they have little to no social skills and are messy and disorganized and forgetful because they're really smart, so it doesn't matter. Some examples in literature include Professor Bear from Little Women, Sherlock Holmes, Dumbledore from Harry Potter, and Doc from Back to the Future. The second trope is the dreamer. I guess this is the femme version of the absent-minded professor. This is the character that lives in books and imagination and is a little odd, but a kindred spirit through and through. Some examples include Luna Lovegood from Harry Potter, Anne Shirley from Anne of Green Gables, and Belle from Beauty and the Beast. And we will talk about autistic princesses another day. The third trope is the bossy know-it-all. This character can overlap as a dreamer as well, and I know I had a difficult time figuring out where to place Anne Shirley. You know what it is based on the title. <laughs> Some examples include Annabeth Chase from Percy Jackson and Hermione Granger from Harry Potter. Fourth one is the one who's bored of societal norms. This is the character that stands in the back corner frowning at a party because they simply do not want to be there, and they tend to seem stuck up, but it's mostly to hide how uncomfortable they are. Some examples include Joe March from Little Women, Mr. Darcy from Pride and Prejudice, and Eugene Onyegin. And our fifth trope is the blank slate. This is the character that seems to have no personality other than being generic, kind human. And it's not a bad thing, but they seem unnaturally perfect and like, how are they a human? One might think it's just lazy character writing, but as an Audi who has tried far too long chameleoning their personality to cater to other people as an attempt to be a perfect goody two-shoots and hoping that that will make them feel more comfortable in society and be able to fade into the background, it's a little too spot on. Some examples include Jane Bennett from Pride and Prejudice and Beth March from Little Women. How do we know that these tropes were created by neurodiverse thinking? Well, 
we don't. But we do know that some of the most famous examples are based on real-life neurodiverse people. And some of these tropes, such as the absent-minded professor, have been traced all the way back to the ancient Greeks. So we know that neurodiversity has definitely been around a while. It's important to mention that a character being one of these tropes does not mean that they are based off of an autistic person or that the author is autistic necessarily. Every book has a couple of these tropes thrown in and has a character with a couple autistic traits because everyone has an autistic trait or two, but that does not mean that everyone is autistic. In general, authors put a piece of themselves into every character that they write. So inherently, every character I write will have autistic traits and an autistic experience in one way or another. So when I read a book and I find that every single character is very autistic in their traits, actions, social patterns, manners of speaking, and response to the world, it makes me pretty sure that the author was also probably autistic. That plus their own life story and personal writings and how people describe them tends to prove my point. Speaking of points, I really dodged mine, but we're getting there, I promise. The first piece of the puzzle is understanding that a well-rounded and well-written autistic character in literature in the past, before we had a name for autism, before anyone thought to do research on it and then purposefully write a character from that perspective, is likely the type of person that we would now categorize as autistic. The second piece is understanding how tropes are created. And essentially, a trope is created by one person doing something super brand new, super out of the box, being mega successful, and then everybody copying it in some iteration. For a basic example, Romeo and Juliet was a wildly successful star-crossed lover story that was world-changing and brand new. And then people kept using that basic idea to create new and successful things throughout time, such as West Side Story and Teen Beach Movie. <laughs> it went from being brand new to being a regular part of our society because everyone saw a good idea and then ran with it. And tropes are the same way. Somebody wrote the perfect story of being the character who lives in her own imagination, People saw themselves in it, and then they ended up building off of that idea. Of course, not all art is created off of other art, and I'm sure people who have never seen art before would probably create their own, and some of these tropes would arise independently, but in general, tropes are another form of trend, so we're gonna have to generalize a little bit here. So to summarize that whole bit, neurodivergent people create the best neurodivergent protagonists and characters because they know what it's like to live in the brain of a neurodivergent person because they are one. <laughs> These characters then go to print, become wildly successful, and people take pieces of them to put into characters that they create. Sure, anyone can write about an absent-minded professor or a bossy know-it-all. We all definitely know a few, and we all relate on some level to pieces of that, but we can never truly understand what goes on inside their brain without the insight of someone who's also autistic and lives all the pieces of that identity. So whether the more commonly known versions of these characters are written by autistic authors or not doesn't really matter. What matters is understanding that at the root of these characters, in one way or another, is an autistic person either as the person who sat down and penned the autistic character that we know today, or as the person who combined a book that they read, written by an autistic person, with somebody that they see on a daily basis. There's an autistic person, an autistic writer, at the bottom of it all. Pretty cool, right? Also, I realized at this point that I'm using autistic and neurodivergent interchangeably, and I want to acknowledge that they are different things. Um, neurodivergent is autistic as well as dyslexic and ADHD and all of that. Autistic is exclusively autism. But it's also incredibly hard to tell the difference between an autistic and an ADHD person in person while having a conversation or if they're both. So I promise you that I'm not going to be able to figure that out with a book, which is why I've been using them interchangeably. But we are now headed into linguistic structure, which is actually more neurodivergent rather than autistic because we're going to be talking about aphasias and echolalia, which are super common in autistic people, but they also exist for a good portion of the population that is not autistic or allistic. So we're going to use the word neurodivergent here on purpose. <laughs> now, as much as I'd like to believe that everyone in the world has taken an intro to psychology class, that is unfortunately not the case. So to everyone who's tired of hearing about Broca's and Wernicke's aphasias, I'm so sorry, but you gotta hear it again. Also, to those of you who have the option to take an intro psych course, please do. It literally teaches you how to study, how to work with people, how to parent, how to just be a good person and how to function within yourself. And it's very important, so you should do it. Okay, aphasias. So we're gonna talk about some of the lesser aphasias, but I will start with the big two just for some context. So an aphasia is defined as a lack of ability to understand or express speech. 
The two most famous ones are Wernicke's aphasia, also known as fluent aphasia, where the person talks fluently but makes no sense and isn't able to understand what is being said to them. A commonly used example of a fluent aphasic sentence is, you know that Smoodle pinkered and that I want to get him round and take care of him like you want before. When they mean to say the dog needs to go to the bathroom, so I'm going to take him for a walk. The other most famous aphasia is Broca's aphasia, where a person has trouble speaking fluently but they can relatively understand what's going on. For example, they understand what you're saying and they want to respond but they cannot come up with the words to do so. So they might say walk dog instead of the sentence from earlier. Both of these aphasias are most commonly caused by brain damage, often by a stroke, and the neuroscience behind them is super cool. But there are also some lesser versions that are simply part of neurodiversity and people are born with them. So we're going to talk about two of those. The first one we're going to talk about is anomic aphasia, which I have. It's kind of a lesser version of Wernicke's in a way, and it's characterized by word retrieval failures, specifically with nouns and verbs. So you know that thing when you're speaking another language that you don't know quite right, and so you can't think of a word and then you talk your way all the way around it until the other person understands what you're talking about? Yeah, so I do that in English. Some of my more notable examples include calling a goose a honk honk dog, which isn't wrong, and a lid a cup hat. Again, not wrong. Somebody I know has called cars the go place box vroom vroom, candy canes Jesus sticks, and food clothes for the stomach. Yes, I do have a running list in the notes of my phone because it's hilarious. But back to my main point. Think of how many times using metaphors and flowery language people talk around things without actually saying the thing in literature. It's insanely common. And where did the idea of doing that come from? Well, probably an anomic aphasic. The second is contiguity disorder, which is kind of a lesser version of Broca's and is categorized by word heaps. So there's no grammatical structure, it's just the important words. For example, hot blanket want gone, rather than I am rather toasty and I request that you remove this blanket from me because I don't enjoy it. Again, looking back at poetry, there are many examples of poems that are written in this precise style. There's a really cool article I read on this called Roman Jakobson and the Two Types of Aphasia that goes through these specifically in depth, which I will link in the description if you are interested. While we're talking about aphasias, here are two that don't have anything to do with literature, as far as I can tell, but since we're here I thought we might just throw them in. So, phonemic paraphasia is one where a sound substitution or rearrangement is made, such as teflon or bean greens. That is also how children just typically speak when they learn new words, so I sometimes wonder why these things need names. Yeah. Okay, and then the other one is semantic or verbal paraphasia, where a person might call an apple an orange or a dog a cat. It's not wrong categorically, it's just also not right. But anyway, back to literature. This one isn't an aphasia, but it does affect speech production. Echolalia is categorized as repetition either of something just heard or something heard hours, days, weeks, even years ago. The common example is somebody saying, do you want some water? And then this person who has echolalia responding with, do you want some water? And I have a tendency to be echolalic when I get very excited about something. For example, when I see a dog, I might go, oh, puppy. And then as I pet it, I will just hold it and continue going, puppy, 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 because it makes me really, really happy. <laughs> the most immediate example that I can think of for this specific thing in literature is actually from the play that I'm in. I have this monologue that follows her stream of consciousness and she repeats words as a way to calm herself until she can launch on to the next one. And this principle also appears in poetry and literature over and and over again. Isn't neurodiversity cool? Also, I very distinctly remember reading something last year about some disorders that characterize the meter of speech and therefore could have led to meter poetry like iambic pentameter and rhyming and such, but try as I might I have been unable to find that article and I don't want to tell you something without a source. Even though in my head it makes logical sense, again having something to back it up is important. So if anybody has a source for it or any people who research this kind of stuff, please send it along. I love learning this kind of stuff and there's not a lot of research into it. And that begs the question, should we be pathologizing any of this? And I mean, no, not really. It's all just part of being human, it's all typical psycholinguistics, and all of these things are normal things that don't need to be medicalized because they aren't an issue, they're just regular methods of speech. So then you may ask why am I making this video if I think we shouldn't be pathologizing literature if that's precisely what I am doing? And it's because, well, people don't often see themselves in literature or poetry. The amount of times that I've been told that poets can't be autistic because we don't understand metaphors, which isn't entirely true, is 
far too many. And the amount of times that I've heard people say that autistic people can't be authors or playwrights or creators because of how we see the world is far too many. The only reason I know about any of this, about minor aphasia being directly connected to literature, is because I told a professor that I was super excited because the author that we were studying seemed incredibly autistic to me, and he responded by saying that it was impossible and didn't believe it, to the point where he practically said that I couldn't be autistic either. And I, being the stubborn human that I am, did some research and discovered a whole world of autistic literary figures. Sure, we've never met them, so we don't quite know, but based on the way they wrote, the way they spoke, the way they acted, and the way that their lives unfolded, it's clear that they were probably autistic, or at least neurodivergent. And it made me finally feel seen and feel that I was told that we weren't or couldn't be a part of. So while there shouldn't need to be a diagnosis between every single type of poetry or character trope, for me it's finally seeing myself in history. It's how I realized that neurodiversity is everywhere and that it's always been around and it's always been changing society for the better in every single walk of life. Not only that, but neurotypical people love it so much that they replicate it and cite it and teach entire classes about how a specific author completely changed literature and language as we know it today. So to anyone who says that neurodivergent people are something new and are a burden to society and can't be successful and can't create art. I have some news for you. If you want a world without neurodiversity, you're gonna have to have a world without Hans Christian Andersen, without Jane Austen or Virginia Woolf, without Alexander Pushkin or Lewis Carroll or William Yeats or Emily Dickinson. That means no Pride and Prejudice, no Little Mermaid, no Alice in Wonderland, no Lake Isle of Innisfree, no Sherlock Holmes or Ugly Duckling or Anne of Green Gables. And if we're gonna expand that into other fields, which I will in other videos, that means Sir Isaac Newton is out too. So is Mozart, Andy Warhol, Tim Burton, Nikola Tesla, Bill Gates, and Steve Jobs, Michelangelo, Thomas Jefferson, Albert Einstein, Charles Darwin, and countless more that I can't even think of right now. So if you want a world that's free of autistics, you can say goodbye to the light bulb, to evolution, to the frescoes of the Sistine Chapel, to quantum physics, to the US Constitution, to your own Mac and PC. Now I've gone on a bit of a ramble here, but you see my point. For me, going into history or literature or films or anything and trying to find people like me is like a little scavenger hunt. It's much like being convinced that a certain person from the past is definitely a lesbian. No, we shouldn't go around pointing fingers or armchair diagnosing, but at the same time we are constantly told that we are not the norm. But we're only not the norm because our stories aren't being told, even though they're there in plain sight. For me, it's just a way of feeling like I can connect to something and feel a little less alone. Because that's the point of art, isn't it? Anyway, special thanks to that professor for making me create a whole new special interest sheerly out of spite, and I would love to hear about the authors and characters that you've always thought were autistic or neurodivergent in some manner. I've also only been able to find a small handful of academic papers on this topic, so if you know of more or of any specific researchers, I would love to read them. Please drop those in the comments as well. I've only been looking at the world through an autism-centered lens in the last year or so, and every time I pick up a new book or an old one, I'm realizing yet again that neurodiversity is everywhere. And frankly, I think that's pretty cool. Anyway, thank you so much for watching to the end, if you've gotten this far. I hope that you've learned a thing, or several, and I hope that you'll come to my show where I play an Audi coded character in a very Audi coded play. Yes, I did some research into the playwright. Yes, I have thoughts. But this video is already far too long, so we're gonna move on. But you should go watch it. Um, let me know what you think, and also don't forget my music video next Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, and also you should subscribe if you want to hear more about neurodiversity now and in history. I'm gonna start making this a bit of a series, I guess, so let me know in the comments if there's any specific things that you want me to cover. And I have rambled yet again. Anyway, I hope that your day is going well. I want to have some sort of cute outro, but I don't know what it is yet, so stand by for that, and I will see you in the next one.